Welcome to Focus Today. I'm your host, Perry Atkinson. Always a delight to have Patrick Doyle in the house. He heads up Veritas Counseling. And today we want to talk about how do you properly work with somebody that you know is addicted to something? Yeah. Is that kind of it? Yeah. You know? I want to talk about, I mean, generally addicts aren't the ones that are going to listen to this show. <laughs> yeah, so you're, you want to turn it off, go ahead. <laughs> it's, it, yeah. And generally the people that I deal with most frequently are people who are related to or love someone who's struggling with addiction. Right. And so the person who's addicted is in denial usually. They're like, what problem? Everything's fine. I don't need any help. Yeah. And so it's the people around them that generally are the ones who start the process. So we've done lots of shows on what is addiction, you know, all that. I wanted to do a show really talking about what are some of the things you can do as a loved one or a friend or someone involved with somebody who's an addict. Um, what can you do to help? And this is the question I get all the time. What should I do? Mm -hmm. And I always say, the first thing I say is, well, I would change the question okay. <laughs> from what should you do to what can you do? Okay. Because should and can are very different things. Mm -hmm. And so many people who are addicted are resistant. You can do this and you can do that and you can try this and you can try that. And what does it end up? Same old thing every time you feel very frustrated, very hopeless, like there's no change. They're not willing. You know, they lie, rationalize, minimize, justify, deny. <laughs> and so it's very frustrating for the person. And what happens is, if you're not careful, the person who is trying to help becomes as sick as the person who's addicted. It becomes as consuming to the person helping. And so, you know, it's like if you, uh, someone's drowning and you go out to help them and they start spazzing out, what are you supposed to do? Let them go. Either that or knock them out. Yeah. Right? Yeah, but yeah. either way, you have to preserve yourself yeah. because, you know, you, you'll I'll both drown. Right. And so when the healthy person starts to get sick, now we have a way less a chance of a good outcome. So this is one of the reasons why I want to talk about today. If you're the person in somebody's life who's trying to help, you, you have to maintain some health. Otherwise, you know, the whole thing can go south really quickly and you can become very um, overwhelmed. And the thing I see with a lot of people who are trying to help is they, they get what I call uh, help fatigue. <laughs> You get just worn out from trying to help somebody who doesn't want to help be helped. Right, right. And the vast majority of my conversations are trying to help people who are trying to help recognize their limits. All right. Let me say to our viewers and listeners, you're welcome to join us as well. If you, if you want to remain anonymous, we understand this is a very delicate uh, topic. Uh, and maybe you have some questions or concerns, maybe you're frustrated in this whole area, you're welcome to join the conversation. The local number is 541-776-5368 or toll free. If you're outside the immediate Medford area, give us a buzz, toll free 1-800-373-5368 and we'll uh, comfort you in. All right, um, now, <clears throat> believe me, uh, I've had my share of people come to me and say, you know, I think this person is addicted to. Right. They can't find the evidence, but the conduct certainly suggests it. Exactly. Uh, can you maybe explain right. that a little further? Well, you know, what I see with people who are uh, in, in relationships, uh, whatever kind of relationship it is, whether it be marital or, you know, friend or whatever, the person who is sensing that the person's an addict mm -hmm. usually doesn't come to that until it's the evidence is stacked pretty high. So most of us want to deny what we see. Right. That's really not happening. Oh, it was just that one time or, oh, you know, they didn't mean that. Or we rationalize ourselves because we don't want it to be true. So by the time somebody's in their gut saying, you know, I think that might be a problem. I think if you're having that sense, you need to go talk to somebody who knows something about addiction and check it out. Don't deny it. OK, so <laughs> the other thing is, is that people who people who want to help miss they they misunderstand their power. <laughs> oh, okay. So we think that because we notice it, or we or we the, or we think we think they want to stop. But I've worked with thousands of addicts. <laughs> they don't want to stop. That don't want to stop. Some yeah. do. And and those two and those two people are very different people. And remember, it's back to my my undergirding belief that all change starts with conviction. Okay, not confrontation. Right. So we think if we just tell them or we, we give them enough help or we loan them enough money or we, you know, be nice enough to them, we give them a place to live, whatever, that they will magically change. And, and I'm, one of the rules of thumb for an addict to change, 
this is the part people don't like, is I've never seen an addict change without significant pain. And what we tend to do is we see their life unraveling because their behavior is creating that. And then we go in there and we slide a mattress under them right before they're going to hit because mm -hmm. we're helping. No, you're not. If you're making it comfortable, you're not helping. What you have to do is pull the rug so that they hit. Now, here's where the dangerous part goes. I've seen, Perry, I've seen people go to their grave in addiction. I've worked with lots of people who just didn't come back. Mm -hmm. My own parents, okay, mm -hmm. died in addiction. And I've worked with hundreds of people in treatment centers who ended up dying in spite of lots of people trying to help. So this is the, the first thing we have to do is we have to let go of the outcome. Listen, I can't control it. I want them to get better. I want them to live differently. I want them to be happy. I want them to be well, but I don't have any control. So the first thing you got to do is let that control go because you don't have it. Mm -hmm. And that's really hard when you're talking about a family member or a spouse or a child, you know, and this is scary stuff, you know, because somebody may destroy themselves. And mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't want that, but we can't control it. And so what we want to do is maintain enough sanity in our own lives that if they, do get, if they do decide they want something different, we're not crazy yeah. from trying to help, right? So that we have some clarity. And so, you know, the idea that, you know, I think of the eagle. Uh, this, this analogy really helped me. Uh, w when the eagle builds its nest, it builds out of pretty rough materials, mm -hmm. right? And so, and it's usually pretty high. And so when the baby chicks, before they get there, they, they line the nest with soft feathers and down and make it really nice and comfortable and easy. And then when it's time for the bird to fly, they pick all that stuff out of the nest. Mm -hmm. So it's uncomfortable and the bird doesn't want to be in there anymore. Mm -hmm. And then they have to fly. Okay. I think that's a good analogy of what we have to do. We want to keep padding it because they're having difficulty and they're always in some sort of crisis. You know, in, with, a, with somebody who's an addict, there's always something in, and you can never get to the bottom of it. Well, you know, that guy and because and then that thing and my guy and my yeah. boss and because, you know, and, I, and you, you can never get to like a clear statement, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And so you start to feel kind of crazy like, well, golly, what, you know, everybody must be against you. I don't know. It must be true. Maybe maybe nobody does like you. Right. You know, you, you just can't believe that somebody's life could be that I think problematic. One of, one of the hard parts is it's, it's hard to stand or sit on the sideline and watch somebody self-destruct. Exactly. Perry. I mean, when you're seeing somebody self-destruct, yes. you're kind of going, you know, your, your humanness yes. added to your humanness is your Christian belief system. Yes. You want to reach in there and grab this thing. <clears throat> right. And, and you know, I've done it both ways uh, in my career, in my life. Um, and I've had lots of family members who are addicts. I've been an addict. So, you know, this is something I know on a very personal level. I also know it as being a treatment professional for years. Uh, you know, your desire to want to make that better is, is, is healthy. Where it gets unhealthy is when you deny the fact that you can't help. Okay. I think that's probably where we need to camp. I've got to yeah. take a break here in a moment. Okay. But there, there, there actually comes a time where you can't help mm -hmm. because the person either doesn't want it or mm -hmm. doesn't believe they need it. Mm -hmm. right. Maybe both. Yeah. Uh, but uh, at that point, they are a human being responsible for their own life. Yeah. Right. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that, I think that's always true. <clears throat> and so when we get back from the break, we'll talk about many people who are trying to help others in this situation, they feel guilty because they see that their life's not going well and they want to help. And they feel guilty because all the things they're doing aren't helping. All right. And we'll, we'll talk about the dynamic of that when we get back. You, uh, if you want to join us, you're more than welcome. Maybe you have somebody in your family that is addicted to something and you really want to help. And um, if you have any questions about this, you're welcome to join us. The local number is 541-776-5368. The toll-free number is 1-800-373-5368. We'll take a break. We'll be right back with Patrick Doyle. Hi, I'm Paulina and I work at the Deaf TV. Did you know that when you support the Deaf TV, you have a profound impact, not only in our community, but around the world? It's your continued support that takes the inspiration and hope in the programs we produce and makes them available to the thousands of people who are watching these videos online every week. Help bring encouragement and hope to our valley and beyond 
by making a secure online donation today at our website, thedove.us. Okay, we're back with uh, Patrick Doyle, Veritas Counseling, and today we're talking about uh, working with somebody that you know has, has got an addiction, or you sense maybe has an addiction, and what should be your approach? How do you go about this? It's very difficult, especially if it's somebody you love, and um, uh, you can become extremely frustrated, and you can do all the wrong things with the right reasons, and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just make the situation worse. And so maybe you have some questions along this line. Maybe it's somebody very close to you, and you know and sense that they're addicted to something, but they're not mm -hmm. taking your advice. Anyway, you're welcome to join us, 541-776-5368, or toll-free, 1-800-373-5368. And um, as we were going to the break, it's, it's interesting that um, you have to reach a point where you may not be able to do anything. Yeah. Well, and I've heard this so many times, Perry, from people, they say, I, I, I just feel guilty of not helping. Right. Um, and I understand the feeling of guilt. Here's what I tell people. If, if you could help and you didn't, feeling guilty would make sense. Okay. But when you recognize the reality of the situation is, you probably can't help. Yeah. So I always start that with this, because uh, I've had, I've experienced the similar things with people coming to me in the years gone by, and I always say, well, have no regrets. Yeah. Right. Try, try to do what you can. Yeah. But you're going to reach a point where you can't do anything. Mm -hmm. At least you satisfied the fact that you've mm -hmm. tried. Right. Most people in the addicted situation, um, <clears throat> one of the rules of thumb I have, if you're working harder than the addict at their problem, <laughs> you're on the wrong track. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> <clears throat> but this is really common. Because the addict, you know, the addict <clears throat> has one rule protect supply wow whatever i have to do to keep doing this i'll do run my mom over steal lie cheat doesn't matter and 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 they're not thinking of it as that they've got it rationalized and they they've got it minimized and they've got it justified they're not living in reality so <clears throat> every addict to survive has to have denial there's that's the only way and so we, we approach them like in this context of our right and wrong and good and bad and do this and don't do that. And they, they chuck that. They don't even, that's not even a part of their deal. Are they rational? <clears throat> no. Okay. They're, they're committed. They're committed to doing what they have to do to get what they need to get. And it doesn't matter who's standing in their way. Okay. Boy, that's a big part of the equation. Uh, somebody told me yesterday um, when logic doesn't work don't apply it <laughs> yeah well my, my, my saying is crazy doesn't make sense uh -huh. you know and when somebody's being uh you know acting in a way that's self-destructive and others destructive that's not that's not sanity yeah it's it's never sane to do something that's self-destructive okay um i want to deal with consequences okay uh, i think yeah, that's we, a big we'll get part to that. all right you're welcome to join us hi eileen uh, what's your question today um <clears throat> uh, I have a friend who's a fairly young man, maybe 55. Anyway, he, uh, he chews. Mm. He's a fine Christian man. Yep. He has a great knowledge of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. He's very, very uh, astute about wanting the word preached properly and everything. <laughs> right. <clears throat> and yet... He's destroying himself. His mm -hmm. teeth, he has a, a horrible attacks of acid indigestion. Mm -hmm. And this right. is all from chewing. I know yeah. it is. And I told him, I said, God doesn't want you to do that. You need to get rid of it. Yeah. And he just continues to do it. So why do you, so why do you think he does it? I don't know. Well, he's addicted to it now. He's been doing it. But it's awful to ride in his car with him. <laughs> Uh, because I don't drive anymore, and he always gives me a ride to the grocery store, uh -huh. and he has a little uh, cup that uh -huh. he spits in. Yeah. Uh -huh. Otherwise, <laughs> this man is so clean and yeah. 
such a good, good person. If anybody's in need, he'll go over and buy their groceries or anything. Right. And so because he chews doesn't mean he's a bad person. Oh, no, no, but, no. But I'm not you, saying but, that. I'm just I saying. I know. I, I'm confirming that's not what you're saying, that you're saying he's a good person, but he keeps doing this thing that's destructive. My question to you is there's a reason why he does it. One is he likes it. Oh, and, yeah. and the consequences to him, he has rationalized. If all my teeth fall out, if I get throat cancer, I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking about the fact that I want to do this. And here's back to what I'm saying. You can talk to him till you're blue in the face. Won't make a difference. Oh, no, I won't talk to him. I just, the one time I said to him, I worked with a man who had surgery because of that, and we yeah. fed him with a pitcher. Yeah. He poured liquid into his mouth. He couldn't chew or swallow mm -hmm. hardly. Right. But, you know, one of the things that people w that we think is that if we talk about the consequences of the addiction, that people will stop. But that's never true. Look at how many people die from smoking, from heart disease, from liver failure, from all the, you know, overdoses. Overeating, yeah. Yeah. People, consequences do not change people. Uh, if that were the case, nobody would be addicted. So I want to know, if he's if he's Christian, why doesn't he feel any conviction about the damage he's doing to himself? Right. And that's the question I would ask him. I wouldn't even talk about the chewing. Oh, no. I'd say, I'd ask him, why do you, why do you, why do you not have any conviction about the harm you're doing to yourself? And see what he says. I will. I mean, well, hopefully, it hopefully it'll spark a little conviction in him. Well, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you, Eileen. All right. You're welcome to join us. The phone number is 776-5368. We're talking to uh, Patrick Doyle about how to uh, help somebody that may be very close to you that is addicted to something. Mm -hmm. And how do you, what's your role in, in that? Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Ted. What's on your mind today? Um, I had to turn off the radio. I didn't want any backwards. Um, okay. So the, um, when we are talking before, the, the, the guy that chews, because that might be a little different. Addiction. I mean, it is addiction, obviously. Yeah. But yeah. I was thinking more of uh, uh, before that. You're I think, talking about people who are crazy or insane, <laughs> yeah. and so they don't really know. I would say they don't really know what they're. I mean, they they may understand what they're doing, but it sounds like they really don't know what they're doing. And mm -hmm. so people like, I guess, that have compulsive behavior yeah. disorder too, I guess. And so um, here we are, Christians, and here that person has damaged himself. Maybe maybe to the point, depending on your theology, maybe to the point that they even walk away from God. So uh, that being the case, um, where does prayer factor in for those people mm -hmm. and for yourself to to try to, to reach them? Because it seems that we just can't be cavalier about it and say, well, you know, uh, they're screwed up, so uh, I'm not going to get involved. You know, mm -hmm. I tried. Right. I don't want to be guilty of casting pearls to the swine. Right. So how do, how do you... How do you how do you deal with it? So, deal with that part. So, is your question, Ted? Uh, what what role does prayer have in the process of helping someone who's addicted? Well, I think that's that's a short. I mean, that's a short stroke on that. But okay. but I mean, prayer is a whole reaching out and uh, and and us dealing with ourselves mm -hmm. in helping somebody. Because we're all you all you admitted it, we're all a bit crazy yeah. to begin with. Oh, so, <laughs> where's our compassion? <laughs> Yeah, well, I, in in the instance that we're talking about, where we're uh, trying to help someone who is addicted and being self-destructive, the role that I would that I would hope prayer would take is first and foremost for me is that I would be uh, asking God to give me wisdom and to help me be obedient to what He wants me to do, rather than me trying to figure it out on my own and doing all these good ideas that I come up with, rather than doing it secondary to God's conviction of me. And that's the other thing I would say to folks is that, listen, your help of someone else in every circumstance, my opinion, not just addiction, should be the result of your conviction not you being a do-gooder or not you doing what you think other people expect, but we should be living our lives out of conviction, not, not some other motive. And so that requires me to spend some time with God and really ask Him and put it on the table to see what He would have me do. And, and I also might need to talk to somebody else who I find spiritually mature or healthy so that I can check that. And obviously, we want to, you know, it always has to be uh, confirmed by what the Scripture says. Okay. okay. We, we don't. We don't. Ever, we just don't throw them away. 
Uh, it is walk. Well, I system. think that sometimes what God calls us to is not continuing in a relationship with them, i.e. what what God instructed Paul to do in 1 Corinthians 5 with the guy who was sleeping with the stepmom. Hey, if he doesn't repent, kick him out. Let, let the consequences come. Um, and the consequences, we hope, will bring about conviction. But, but never are we casting someone out because we don't care. Sometimes, very painfully, we allow them disconnection in hopes that that will convict them. All right. I think that's a good, a, the right. good distinction. Thank you, Ted. Uh, you're welcome to join us, 541-776-5368 or toll-free 1-800-373-5368. We're dealing with uh, how do you help somebody that's an addict one way or the other. Um, they seem to be, uh, addicts seem to be uh, manipulative. Oh, yeah, definitely. Because if they were honest, would you participate? <laughs> Hey, I want you to give me twenty bucks. I'm gonna go buy some crack. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, you're, you know, and I and I use that as an extreme example, but there's all kinds of examples, and everyone who's trying to get their way instead of being loving is generally manipulative in some fashion, whether it be power and control, or whether it be you know playing the victim, or whether it be lying, rationalizing, minimizing, making up stories, um, and so. You know, really, that's what I keep wanting to get back to is that those of us who are in the lives of the addicts have to maintain some objectivity and some health. Otherwise, we get sucked into the process of being just as sick as they are. And, and that, that looks differently because I'm not getting loaded, but internally and emotionally, I'm all spun up. Mm-hmm. And I don't have any peace, and they, they run me up one side and down the other, and they, they can spin me up or spin me down. They, they gain control. And I, I say to people all the time, you know, we don't want to let crazy drive the boat. Okay. Um, there's mm-hmm. the threat of consequences, and then there's the actual yes. act of consequences. Yes. At what point do they become... <laughs> Right. Individualized. Okay, so with an addict, I would say never threaten a consequence unless you intend to do it. Because here's the deal. If you say, well, if you don't, because, and then I'm going to, and then you don't follow through, you just embolden them. Now they're like, they don't have the will, and they'll ratchet up their manipulation on you. And so, but, it's, but no one sits down and you know, writes you an email and says, now, <laughs> because you didn't follow through, now I'm going I'm to treat you worse. Yeah. It just happens. And so you have to have some clarity. And this is why I would encourage you to talk to somebody who knows about addiction. This is why I would encourage you to get some, you know, get around some other people so you can check. I mean, if you went to somebody who you trusted and had some maturity and you checked your belief structure, you'd probably come away going, well, yeah, I probably shouldn't feel guilty about that. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm trying to help them. At what point, at what point is, is your help now hurting? That would be a question I would ask. You know, and I think, particularly when I look at parent situations, that's where I see the line, or, or family situations, the line gets really blurred because it's my child. What do you mean I can't help them? What do you mean I have to let them suffer? What do you mean they might go to jail? What do you mean they might die? What you, I can't let that happen. And so, again, a lot of times parents don't have the will, and until God helps them, mm-hmm. they won't. Yeah. And so, part of our job is to support them in that struggle. You know, and that's a very difficult thing. All right, let me take a break. If you want to join us, uh, give us a call, 541-776-5368 or toll-free 1-800-373-5368. And uh, if you have any questions about uh, how do you handle an addict or what do you do, give us a call. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Dan and I work at the Dove TV. You know, compared to Portland, Seattle, and L.A., Medford might be considered a small market, But at The Dove, we're excited about the opportunity to make a big impact right here in our community. And you help make that happen. Did you know that more than 90% of our income comes from people like you? You can help us now by making a secure online donation at our website, thedove.us, or by phoning 541-776-5368. Patrick Doyle's with us, and today our topic is how do you reach out and minister or help someone that you believe is addicted to something. Uh, Maybe you know what it is openly, but uh, whatever the case is, what is the proper way of doing that? And maybe you've become frustrated with it. 
uh, you're scared about it, um, don't know what to do. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a great opportunity for you to give us a call. 541-776-5368 is the local number. And then if you're outside the immediate uh, Medford area, wherever you may be listening or watching, you're welcome to join us, 1-800-373-5368. Part of the addiction problem mm. that I've noticed through the years is you'll know that something is wrong because yeah. there's this pattern developing that uh, of no change. Yeah. And there seems to be an augering in of a lifestyle that yeah. doesn't seem to have any freshness to it. It's mm -hmm. just there. But you don't know what it is. You mm -hmm. don't know what the addiction mm -hmm. is. Um, yeah. You can't seem to pinpoint it, yeah. but there's something going on in this person's yeah, life that's yeah, making yeah. them auger in. Yeah, what exactly. do you do with that? Well, and, and that's, part of the, that's part of what we call the crazy making, because you know something's happening, but, you, but because they're not telling the truth, and they're not being honest about it, and they're minimizing it, and they're justifying it, and they're rationalizing it. But there's a part of you that just is like, there's something wrong here. And you, but you can never, like, get an answer. Oh, you know, I, <laughs> I drank a fifth last night, or I smoked, you know, an eighth in the last, you know, whatever. So what happens is, is that until you have some clarity about what they're doing, which is maybe a confrontation, you know, you say, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about what's going on. It feels to me like maybe there's some some addiction going on maybe i don't know it seems like you're a little out of control i'm concerned about you okay now here's the thing with addicts you're not going to get a clear answer very rarely maybe after treatment <laughs> maybe after sobriety they'll come to you and say oh yeah this is what i was doing but generally they're not going to come come clean so you have to you have to go have that face to face and you have to trust what your senses say not so much your brain because they're going to lie to you and they're going to send you on a rabbit trail they're going to try to minimize, justify, and they're going to try to do the smoke and mirrors thing with you and get you off the scent, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but, you know, you, you, you watch behavior and you don't listen to words, okay? You were late for work, you know, you missed your payment, you haven't, whatever. You see the behavior that's going on, and when you talk to them, you don't talk about I think, I feel, or whatever. What you do is you say, here's what I see, and then you're very concrete about behavior that you have seen firsthand. You haven't made your payment. You haven't been treating your kids well. Your, your husband thinks you're up, you know, whatever. So it's, it's very behavioral. It's very concrete. Now, they're going to flip out. I have never confronted an addict who's in denial and had them go, oh, gee, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I have been taken to the floor on a few occasions in a treatment center when I confronted somebody because they were so angry that I would say those things about them even though I had you know a stack of evidence to the ceiling so I just want you to understand don't expect people to go oh okay you know and if they do you should be suspicious <laughs> it's what? probably a manipulation are they on a collision course with with something bad yeah okay. because you can't you can't be controlled by a substance or a compulsion and end up in a good place any, anytime, anywhere. I mean, how many more examples from culture do we need? We just had one this past week. This act, actor at 40, I don't know, 48, 49, mm -hmm. died of an overdose. Very talented guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many more times is this going to happen? I don't know. A uh, lot. This is a lot, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, you're welcome to join us. Let's go to the phones. Hi, Russ. Uh, what's on your mind today? Good morning, guys. Morning. Hey, listen, I got a um, 33 year old son lives up in Central Oregon, and he's dealing with uh, alcohol issues, the old mm. wine, women, and song thing. He's been mm. on and off this crazy cycle a half a dozen times. Mm. And I just need to know how much... I, I've been clean and sober for five years, and I Good. see a lot of pattern in what he does, and uh -huh. I've worked through the guilt issues of that, I think. Good. Um, but I just wonder how involved I should get. I, I mean, we've had the conversation. He kind of goes into seclusion. I don't hear for, from him for a long while. Right. And then he'll appear again, you yeah. know, that kind of thing. He usually appears when he has a need? Oh, yeah. He's mm -hmm. a taker, for sure. In yeah. fact, that's one of my biggest issues. I've got a mother in California who every time he calls her, she sends him cash. Yep. Yeah, and see, this is, this is the thing that, you know, until the family system starts to deal with him as a whole, like on a unified front, he'll find the weak link. Right. Until he has some sort of conviction or change. Now, I noticed when you asked the question, you said, what, what should I, how, how involved should I be? And again, I want to change the question to how involved can you be? Right. I mean, you have to take into consideration your own, your own boundaries. 
Um, I mean, you having been through a process of recovery, you know that giving him money isn't the answer. Right. And you know that helping him out of his difficulty that he created by his in, uh, unhealthy behavior isn't the answer. Mm -hmm. So now comes the hard part is, can I watch some of the difficulty happen and hope that it brings him to his knees? And then if, well, he comes, if he comes out of the pain and says, hey, Dad, I really recognize I'm out of control, I need help, that's a whole different thing. Then you put your resources in because they're in a receptive place. You're not wasting your resources. Yeah, and that and, makes sense. And so, you know, you're going to need to probably sit down with your mom and say, Mom, look, you're hurting him by giving him money. And here's why. And I've talked to, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of addicted families, families with addiction in it. And here's the thing. You know, they think that if they give them money that it's going to solve the problem. And what, what the family doesn't do is talk about the reality of the behavior of the person they're trying to help. Hey, mom, he's doing this, 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 and this. I'm pretty sure she's not going to want those kind of behaviors to continue. Well, I'm sure that's the case, too. And, I, yeah. and, I've, and I've told her, and I, I pray a tough prayer for my kid every night, you know, that God will take him wherever he needs to go to figure it out. Yeah. Tough, and so tough. I share that with my mom, and I thought yeah. the last thing we need to do is, as you put it, throw a mattress under him before he hits the ground. <laughs> exactly. And she shakes her head the right direction, but she <laughs> yeah. just has no willpower when he. When yeah. He she says calls. yeah. She says yes. <laughs> <You know>? Her <laughs> right. mouth is saying yes. Her head is saying no. And so, but and so that's an ongoing relational issue between you and your mom of her coming to a place of health as well. I mean, she's she's coming from a place of sympathy or you know, wanting to help and she didn't want anybody to suffer and all that. And you, you, you might need to educate her a little bit, a bit about the reality of the circumstance. And I found that to be true in my own circumstance when I work with people. The more I can get them into the reality of what's happening with the person, the more it sobers them up to, oh, well, we're helping them do that? Well, we don't want to mm -hmm. do that. Instead mm -hmm. of everybody sort of turning a blind eye to, oh, they're fine. We d they just need a little financial help and they'll be fine. Well, one of the comments I've heard is, well, it took you until you were 50 to figure it out. He's only 33. Yeah. Well, we, uh, let's hope he doesn't waste another 15 years. That's my prayer. Yeah. yeah. And so we don't know when God's timing is. And this is why I think it's so important that you be in a place of moving out of conviction, not out of trying to prevent the outcome you don't want. I hear you. Okay. You know, Thanks, and, Russ. And I wish right, I thank could, you guys. I wish I had a nice, you know, pleasant way to say everything will be all right, but... I just seen too many people go to their graves in this stuff, and we don't know what'll happen. All right, let's go to hi, Joel. What's your thought today? Um, after working for over thirty years in a recovery program, um, thing I have found as a Christian leader is that we need to lead them into green pastures and buy still waters, and not try to drive them into treatment. <laughs> yeah, right. You know the saying, Joel, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink? Uh, you can take him out in the stream, maybe, but uh, that's about <laughs> as far as you can go. I changed the saying. It's true, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But you can give him a lick off a salt tablet and encourage their thirst. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. You and, know that went bad. And I, and I think that's what you're talking about, is that through our relationship, we want to increase their thirst for the wellness. Rather than browbeating them into what we want. Is, would that make sense to you? It totally. And the other part of it is we okay. leave the rest to God. He separates out the sheep from the goats. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Joel. Uh, what do you say to somebody that becomes angry? They just can't seem to make any progress, and they find themselves internalizing this, and now they're dealing with a sickness themselves. Yeah. So... <laughs> I mean, I've had people in my office who are just absolutely furious at what's going on. Right, because and I realize there's other issues on the table besides <laughs> yeah, the person yeah. that's addicted. You know? <laughs> so the person who's trying to help us furious, is yeah. that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's where you're going to end up. Uh, when, when you're talking to somebody who doesn't want to change and they keep coming to you to help them change, you know, eventually the anger, and remember, I believe anger is, you know, the thing that gets to the surface, but below anger is hurt. And below hurt is injustice. Mm. It's like, why is this person doing this to me? They're mm -hmm. just using me. That's irritating me. That's, that's hurting me. I don't like that. And I've never met an addict that wasn't a user of people. Because we have to be to survive. You know, if I was independently, if I was, you know, Howard Hughes, I could lock myself in the top room of my, you know, penthouse, penthouse yeah. <laughs> in my, you know, my hotel and just 
you know, be by myself. But that's that's you know that's the vast majority of addicts have to have other people to keep it working, and they have to have money because they're not you know taking care of business or they're spending too much. You know, and um, uh, the 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 end result of somebody uh, not getting help with addiction is their life will be destroyed. It won't have any quality to it of, of any of any kind. They they might have money, but they're not gonna the thing that the thing that we say in recovery is that addicts don't have relationships. They take hostages. And if you feel like a hostage, that's because they're probably addicted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, let me take a break. If you want to join us, give us a call, 541-776-5368 or toll-free, 1-800-373-5368. We'll be right back with Patrick Doyle. Hi, I'm Paula, and I work at the Dove TV. Every day we get letters and emails from people who've been encouraged, blessed, and challenged by the programs on the Dove TV. But we couldn't do it without you. Did you know that more than 90% of our income comes from people like you? You can help us continue to bring inspiration and hope to our community by making a secure online donation at our website, thedove.us, or call us at 541-776-5368. All right, we're back. Uh, Patrick Doyle's with us, and uh, we're going to wrap this up today. We're talking about... uh, Dealing with people that you know have an addiction, there's something in their life that's got control of them mm-hmm. that doesn't allow them the freedom and the love and mm-hmm. the common sense that yeah. you want to see in their life. And right. it's starting to spill over into relationships, into money management, mm-hmm. into jobs, uh, the whole the whole gamut of right. things. And, uh, and you're sitting there and you're saying, well, hey, I want to jump in there and help. And that's noble and probably a very Christian thing to do. But how do you do that? Yeah. And can you do that? Yeah. Is a big question. Exactly. So if you want to join us, we, we'll take your calls. 541-776-5368. That's the local number. 541-776-5368. And then the toll-free number is 1-800-373-5368. Um, this is an interesting thing because... Um, I guess we have a hard time in today's culture um, still believing that this is so common <laughs> and yeah. addicts are able to get whatever they're addicted to so easily. Yeah. Uh, granted, it takes money. I understand mm-hmm. that. Yeah. But I am still shocked that the network system out there is so vast. <laughs> yeah. It's easy to get marijuana. Mm. Well, uh, easier than ever now. Anything, yeah, you know. Yeah. It's just out there. Yeah, and, and, and marijuana is, you know, there's a lot of talk about how it's not really a problem and it's not really a drug. But as, a, as somebody who is addicted to marijuana, <laughs> yeah. I'm here to tell you that it, it'll destroy you. But it, it, the, way that, the way that marijuana destroys people is very different than the way other drugs destroy people. Okay, let me, uh, what, let me that's maybe where we ought to go. What are the symptoms of marijuana versus meth versus something else, harder well, drug? So... When, you, when you're talking about meth or alcohol or heroin or those kind of drugs, you're talking about a, you're talking about a drug that has a very um, quick high. You, you take the drug and you're high really quickly, and then it goes out of your system relatively quickly. Marijuana is more like this slow, arching thing that you, is almost imperceptible. So <laughs> people who are addicted to weed don't have these what we cl- what we consider addicted behaviors because you know if you smoke weed today it's going to take 16 days roughly to get half of that out of your system really or, yeah if you if you if, if i went in the other room and drank you know an ounce of alcohol i'd i'd be a little tipsy but an hour is gone right yeah. weed's l- really long half-life okay so that's why you don't see the withdrawal factor that's why they say it's not addictive but i'm telling you that's not true it's a gateway well it, I, well I, more I, than a gateway i guess i, I yeah. think my opinion is that nicotine is the gateway. Okay. And I'll tell you why. All right. So all the things you have to do to have a good addiction, uh, lie, uh, break the law, uh, do all these things, go, uh, you know, hide. I mean, you, you get somebody who's 15, 16, 13, 12, whatever, and, and they smoke cigarettes. They have to do all the things necessary to start building denial. Right there. Right there. Yeah. And so... You know, and you know, we, we oh, it's just it's just cigarettes. I'm not a drug addict, but you you have to 
you have to start developing all the structures in, that you need to have a good denial system. And so that's why I think it's, uh, the other thing I think about nicotine that no one's really talking about is that in all my years in treatment, what I noticed was that nicotine, so when you, when you intake nicotine, nicotine's a stimulant. So it increases your heart rate and constricts your blood vessels, which is basically the exact same response your body has for stress. You're, you're preparing for fight or flight, right? Mm -hmm. Your heart rate increases and your blood vessels constrict. So you feel stressed out, you smoke a cigarette, and you feel relief. But you just doubled your stress response. Mm -hmm. So how could you feel relief? Well, the reason why you feel relief is because nicotine distracts you from the feelings, internal feelings you have, and that's the relief. But physically, you got no relief, you just doubled your stress response. So. I believe that nicotine is way all about emotions. That's why people smoke. It makes them, it distracts them from how they feel. And this is the other thing I was going to say is that, listen, I've never met an addict that wasn't deeply pained. Under every addiction is a profound level of hurt. And just remember that hurt is in the eyes of the beholder. It doesn't matter whether or not I think it should hurt. Mm -hmm. If they believe right. it hurts, that's usually the fuel system for the addiction because the addiction is all about altering how I feel. Mm. Boy, very well said. All right. Uh, hi, ma'am. You're on the air. What can we help you with? Hi. Um, I just wanted to uh, speak to the marijuana thing. I have a, a son who I believe is addicted mm -hmm. to the marijuana, and we had to actually kick him out of the house like mm. 10 days before Christmas mm. a year ago because... We had asked him not to do it, and he did it anyway. Mm -hmm. And his excuse was, well, you told me not to smoke it in the house or on the property. And I said, no, I don't want it in your body while you live here. Right. But mm -hmm. um, we go around and around, and he just is, mm -hmm. he says he's a really strong Christian, mm -hmm. but we go around and around on mm -hmm. this topic, and he mm -hmm. says that it's a substance that God created. Yeah. And, but I see it as destroying his life. Yeah. And I, I just don't know what to do because you know you really hit the nail on the head when you said you feel like a, um, you didn't say victim, but t being held hostage. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I'm being held hostage whenever he comes back into my life, mm -hmm. and it's it's just um, mm -hmm. how, I don't know how, how to get victory over this. How old is he? <laughs> Thirty-two. Ah, okay, so the first place to start is for you to accept that he's a pot smoker. Yeah, I I do. No, I, you don't. You desperately want him to do something else. Oh, absolutely, okay, yeah. So, so here's the yeah. deal. It gets in your way of loving him. And here, here's what I'm saying is he's an adult man. He's got his own life. What I want you to do is ask God for help to love him where he's at. You can't control him. You can't tell him what to do. But you can love him. And here's the deal. He's running from something. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but I guarantee it's something. And there's also a cultural thing going on right now in our country where weed is in vogue. Weed is cool. Weed yeah. is good. Weed is what everybody needs. If we all smoked weed, we'd have a better country. And uh, I've talked to you know hundreds of people about all the arguments about how weed is not as bad as alcohol and all these other things and how they justify that. But at the end of the day, I'm still altering my mind. Why right. do you, why do you need to alter yourself? Why why is reality not good enough? Right. And this is what I'm saying is that if you can get to this place where you can say, son, you know, talk to me about what's going on inside of you. Just skip the weed. Just don't even talk about it. But get below the surface of. What's going on in your world? What, how, you how do you feel about yourself? I mean, what's going on? What, how are your relationships? How's your job? And do not give him one, sh one ounce, not any, unsolicited advice. Okay. <laughs> That's going to be hard, you know, as a mom. I know. But see, <laughs> this. every time you give him advice, he hears you say he's a failure. Okay. And I know that's well, not... that makes sense. I don't think that's what you want. No, absolutely so, not. So what I want you to do is just is talk to him. I would, even, I would even go so far as sometimes to confess your own sin to him. I don't mean, you know, deep, dark, 
heavy stuff. But, you know, confess what you're struggling with. Be a real human. Don't try to be the standard he needs to meet. Okay. And well, that's good advice. And try to connect with him. Because here's the thing. I say this all the time to parents, and I don't care how old your kids are. Authority is empowered by relationship. And when we destroy the relationship over the behavior, right? See, right. and so listen, can you have a relationship with him? I don't know. We'll see. Can you have a relationship with him on some level? So, Well, I do have a relationship. It's just there's this there's a block. Um, boundary that I need yeah. to set in order to have peace in my own home. Right. He can't you do know? it in your home. He can't right. be a part of that. But, you know, he's 32. He's going to have to have his own life. Right. And so what I'm saying is, is that you make that boundary, but you also love him from where you're at instead right. of trying to say, if you do this, this and this, then we can have we can have this deep relationship that I want. Maybe what you have to do is accept that all he's willing to do is this little one. Yeah. And if that's what he's willing to do, then live inside of that. Well, and maybe I, I feel like we have a good relationship. And but maybe maybe God through what struggle. maybe God through whatever situation you're in will will speak to him through you. Maybe he won't. But I do know this. There's probably nobody on the planet that loves him more. Oh, you know, I know God would use a donkey to speak to him. But, I'm not worried about that. He, we, did you hear what I said? What what was that? There's nobody on the planet that loves him more than you. I know that. Okay. So I would also maybe at times let him in on how hurt you are that the relationship's where it's at. Yeah. And let your emotion to the service. I can hear it in your voice. And yeah. uh, I want you to get a little more real with him and let go of the outcome. Okay. 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 Thank you. I've been working on it. Thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome. Wow. That was brilliant. Let me see if I can squeeze Lori in real quick. Lori, I only got a couple seconds, but go ahead quickly. Pat, I just wanted to say your response to this lady was so, is so incredibly outstanding, <laughs> and I want to thank God for the wisdom that was able to get agape love looks past the fault to see the need, and Jesus always addressed the need, and you just incredibly addressed this woman's need it was so healing. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Lori. All right, thank you, Lori. <laughs> uh, it was. It was brilliant. Um, I think that in that answer came um, a, a, a real valuable part of this trying to help, and yeah. that is, um, well, first of all, the outcome, just get that off the table. Yeah, we can't control uh, it. Two is, if it is a relative, and your love for that relative is being affected by what you perceive they should be doing. Yeah, you'll never conquer this thing mm -mm. because never. you when you start to see them as your agenda, you know you have to fix them. Mm -hmm. You cease to love them because now it's about you getting what you need so you can feel better. And addicts, I've never met an addict, Barry. This is the crazy thing. I've never met an addict, and I've met hundreds, <laughs> thousands, that wasn't really perceptive. They're always very perceptive people. They're, they're always highly perceptive people and, and so, usually sensitive. So truth can get in whether yes. they accept it or not. But That's it, another story. It, it can get in. Right. And if, you, if they know you care about them, that will open the door more than anything else. Uh, this isn't fair, but does an addict fear losing that control? That's why they don't give it up? Well, yes and no. Okay. It's, that's a long. That's another answer. show. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry about that. That's that right. was a big question at the last minute there. All right. Uh, Veritas Counseling. 622-6018. 622-6018. Or VeritasCounseling.com. Or VeritasCounseling.com. All right. Patrick Doyle, thanks, friend. You bet. We'll see you next time on Focus Today. Hi, I'm Jim and I work at the Dub TV. Every weekday between 6 and 8 a.m., our award-winning news and sports team bring you the best morning show around. It's live, it's honest, and it's a whole lot of fun. And you help make it happen. 
Did you know that more than 90% of our income comes from people like you? You can help us continue to air local programs that share your voice by making a secure online donation at our website, thedub.us.